Good day. Good cloudy, cold day. Oh my gosh. So welcome to the Iowa Files. We have an uh, absolutely perfect program for those of you who love military history and just history of all sorts. So I want to thank the West Des Moines Library, who is our partner in all of this, the Friends Foundation of the West Des Moines Library for providing funding, and the Iowa Arts Council so we can continue to live stream and offer these recordings and these programs free of charge. So our speaker today, Michael Vogt, is a native of Gladbrook, and he is curator for the Iowa Gold Star Military Museum, which is at Camp Dodge in Johnston. Has anybody been there before? It's a pretty amazing museum, isn't it? It's, and if you haven't been there, this is your order. Go see that museum. It's fantastic and very interesting and educational. He is an accomplished author writing a, for so many magazines about American and military history. Um, he was very kind and loaned us exhibits from his museum for our West Des Moines at War exhibit at the Jordan House Museum, which you can see through December of this year, and then it is going away and we're putting in a new exhibit. So he is generous as well as intelligent. So no further ado, Mike Vogt. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good I always afternoon. I always start this question out by asking, did anyone here have a relative that went through Camp Dodge in the First World War? First, First World War. Yep. Okay. No, but my second second great grandfather, we have a he got investigated because he had immigrated with his family to this country. When he was five, they had never gotten citizenship. So during that time, he became a husband of German citizens. And sure. they investigated him and found out that he had been farming here all his life, basically. I'm trying to, trying to remember what I looked at a while back, and they had a list of what they titled enemy aliens, people that were Germans, but it, somewhere in the immigration process, but had not been naturalized yet. There was also a program, I uh, will touch on this, I think it might be in here, where they they tried to put immigrants on the fast track once they joined the army to get that paperwork taken care of so that they could enroll and, and not be suspected of anything. So today's presentation is going to be on Camp Dodge during the First World War. For over 100,000 soldiers, it was uh, would become their home away from home. For a lot of these soldiers, it was the first time they spent any lengthy time off the farm, out of the small town, uh, or to a different location. And I'm going to pause here for a moment. If I fail to project, give me the international I can hear you sign, and I'll, I'll try to speak a little louder. So with that mentioned, oops. wonder if this turned off. That's work. Well, we'll do it manually. We can do it that way. Um, 6 April 1917, the United States enters the First World War on the side of the Allies. The, the British, the French, the Russians, the Belgians, uh, and other nations in Europe against the central powers made up of Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and Bulgaria. The United States, as you can see there, goes to war, and the first job for Uncle Sam, I'm sorry, to keep grabbing this, first job for Uncle Sam is to raise an army and train an army that will be large enough and effective enough to make a difference on the Allied side. On 1 April 1917, the United States Army, including all of the National Guard units, all of the Army Reserve units, and the United States Regular Army totaled a little over 213,000 men. That's about the total number of casualties that the British and the French and the Germans suffered in the Battle of the Somme and the Battle of Verdun. So an army of that size was not going to make a noticeable difference. So in order to create an army that would, the War Department decided to expand the United States Army three ways. They created, and Congress has to approve all of these, approve this plan. So uh, Congress approves a War Department plan to expand the number of regular Army divisions 
up to number 25. They lay them out on a big spreadsheet. Uh, what the first through the eighth divisions would end up deploying to France, serving with the AEF, the American Expeditionary Force. They created National Guard divisions. You can see number 26 through 15, a division at that time, as you can see at the bottom, number 27,000 soldiers, almost twice the size of a European division. And so they would group National Guard units regionally. For example, uh, the Iowa National Guard was merged with National Guard units from Minnesota, North and South Dakota, and Nebraska to give them approximately, and then they would recruit to bring them up to the 27,000 number that would fill out an entire division. And then the draft went into effect, the Selective Service, it was essentially a draft, and those draftee divisions were numbered 76 through 93. Or actually, sorry, numbered uh, 70 through the 102nd. The ones in the parentheses are the, the Selective Service, or the sometimes called the National Army divisions that deployed to France. When we get back to the National Guard units, is they organized National Guard units regionally like four, four infantry regiments to a division, and they would have artillery and machine guns, machine gun regiments, artillery battalions. There were a bunch of orphan units left over after this process. Some sharp pencil clerk at the War Department realized we have enough orphans to almost create one more division. And so they took these orphan units from 26 different states and the District of Columbia and formed them into the 42nd Division. And they nicknamed that, that, you, that division, earned the nickname the Rainbow Division because there were so many people from the United States, almost everybody under the rainbow would serve in that unit. And one of the Iowa National Guard units was a leftover unit, the 168 Infantry Regiment. It's still part of the Iowa National Guard today. And they were placed in the 42nd Division as a result they would see more combat on the Western Front than any other Iowa-affiliated unit in the First World War. That's just kind of the way it pans out. We're going to drop down here to the Selective Service. Um, they created 16 different camps, cantonment camps, to train the soldiers, the draftee soldiers of the National Army. And in June 1917, Camp Dodge was selected by a War Department committee to be the training site 13th Cantonment in the training site for the 88th Infantry Division, and they would train there until their deployment in late June, early July 1918 to France. And then some units of the 19th Division, they started to create the 19th Division there, and the war ended, and that process stopped. But as a result of those War Department decisions and the, the need to expand the, the United States Army and the National Guard Divisions and the draftee divisions, a Camp Dodge would grow to be the largest military base in Iowa's history. And that story awaits us. One of the things that was a big selling point to the War Department Committee was the fact that a set of railroad tracks already ran through the area of near Camp Dodge, which meant they could not only deliver personnel, construction workers, but also the raw materials needed to construct the camp. For a while, they were trying to sell, the idea was cooked up to try to sell an area called Beaver Gardens because it's not very far from Beaver Creek and sell lots and houses out there. That, that never came to fruition, but you can see that's a, that predates the war in 1913 Des Moines Tribune ad. Camp Dodge inductee totals by state. Some are estimates, of course, for Montana and Tennessee. But uh, you can see the total for Iowa, 37,111. I keep pointing and I forget I've got a pointer here. You can see the Camp Dodge number there. But mostly the inductees came from the north central United States. There were some inductees, and we'll get back to the story from Alabama, that were African-American soldiers. The Army was still segregated at that time, and they had African-Americans trained at different locations, a lot of them in the north because they thought they would be treated better and face less prejudice. There are some that would say Southerners fear too many blacks that were armed in the South at any place and that they parceled them out to different locations for that reason. I, I've not read that, but given the given perspectives at that time, that's certainly a possibility.
give you a sampling of the types of units that went into the 88th Division. Like I said, four infantry regiments, artillery regiments, machine gun, I think those are battalions, uh, then engineers, ammunition train, sanitary train. Most of the units were numbered, if they were organic to that camp, they were numbered with a three in them. Those three 13th engineers, three 13th ammunition train. It got the nickname the Cloverleaf Division, and you can see a cloverleaf worn by uh, off the uniform, someone that served in the artillery. Most of the troops after the war would wear a black cloverleaf. Uh, infantry sometimes would wear a blue cloverleaf because that was the branch color. And the, uh, the artillery wore a red cloverleaf. And so I, and we don't have a uniform in the collection with the red cloverleaf. We have blue, we have black, but a artillery cloverleaf has not come into the collection. I'll see if anybody can figure out why was it the 88th, why was the 88th division called the Cloverleaf? Because it looks like a Cloverleaf. Yes. It's got four circles. It does. And on the uniform, it was usually tilted about another 45 degrees so that the Cloverleaf looked like this. And somebody smarter than me realized that if you laid two eights over top of each other, it looks like a Cloverleaf. And that's the origin of the 88th Division's Cloverleaf. Other divisions have different stories, parts of their history are implemented, but for Camp Dodge, for the 88th Division. And the 88th is now a, it's like a, a, a support unit, but they are part of the Army Reserve and they are, they still have a headquarters up in Minnesota. So, but they were created at Camp Dodge during World War I. Is sanitary train exactly what it sounds like? Uh, it was part of like the medical corps. Okay. So they would, uh, responsible for hospitals and things like that. Okay. Can I ask? Sure. Um, like my grandparents or great grandparents, they would have maybe fought in World War One. Were they drafted or they volunteered? I mean, I don't know any it, of that it could, history. Were they from Iowa? Yeah. If you come out to Camp Dodd sometime, ask that question and we can look at the service cards for World War I, then I would be able to answer that question. But it's either one or the other. They were either drafted or they volunteered or they served in the National Guard and were federalized. Dad was, was real big out there. Mm -hmm. And um, I just never really talked about his father or my mom's father or any of those mm -hmm. people, whether they were ever in, drafted to go into World War I. Sure, you said, what was, what's your dad's name or what was your dad's oh, name? I Dennis Starkey. Yes, he used to come out on Wednesday mornings for coffee. He was a 34th Division guy in the Second World War. I knew him. So yeah. I never know about his dad or... Yeah. Well, a, a knock on the door sometime, and then we'll, we'll be able to look him up. I and... brought his picture out. Mm hmm I think I gave it. That could have been. To you. Yeah, we can look that up and answer that question. It'll tell us what units he yeah. served in when he was inducted or drafted. Wondering. Do you know if any of them were drafted or stayed in their field? The camp at its total was 5,200 acres, and they had in excess of 1,400 buildings. The majority of them, like you see all these replicated buildings here, were barracks buildings, and they would build over 150 of them. This was a detention compound out here. They also had some barracks buildings. They also had an incinerator. You can see this little spur line comes out here. There was an incinerator here. More on that story. These, this was the remount station where they would train horses and mules. Uh, Model T's, Model A's, other vehicles had made their appearance by the time of the First World War, but the Army still, remained, still relied primarily on horses and mules for its transportation needs. And so they had, a, they had a remount station. Years later, the wooden stanchions from which the horses and mules would feed, after the war at some point in the 20s, they got pushed into this tree line. And if you were to travel out there today, you would still see those old stanchions, of the trees growing up around them. They just, what are you going to do with them when the war's over? They got them out of the way so they could till that soil and grow crops. But those reminders were still there. To give you a, a reference, this road here, present day, would be Northwest 70th Avenue. And Johnston is down here. This is Beaver Drive. It winds up the hill here. This river, Des Moines River, would be dammed, and Sailorville Lake sits out there. There used to be a, a rifle range in this area. It's underwater now. 
There was a hospital complex. This little triangle here is the town of Harold, and the rail line ran through camp this way. It's gone now, it was taken out in the 1980s, but the discerning eye, you can still see that bed where the railroad tracks ran, but that was a, a boon to the camp. They built additional rail sidings, we'll see here in the photos coming up, to offload supplies and troops and personnel. And let's see if I can find it. This road would be Northwest 86th Street, if you were to extend that up through the north. So I, and all of this area within the perimeter of the map, the perimeter lines, uh, was either rented or purchased during the First World War. Not only did Harold have a corner on the market, it had three corners on the market. Is that little town existed right there? A lot of soldiers came in to buy aspirin or socks or souvenirs or whatever. The Charles White's company, White's, uh, his father came to Des Moines in the 1850s to build houses as, a, as an immigrant from Germany. But the White's company, you can see the name there, Charles White's sons, they were the general contractors for Camp Dodge during the First World War. So they relied on a, an army of laborers to come out there and construct that camp. They begin to drive their nails, first nails, and, and move earth. 19 June, 1917, you can see a couple laborers there with hand saws cutting through what looked to be maybe four by eight or six by eight beams. He's, he's working with a hand saw there. This image shows a lot of the buildings already up. On the back side of this, if we were to turn it over, there's writing on the back. And when it first came into the collection and I looked at it, not sure, couldn't quite make out its pencil. So, you know, pencil gets rubbed over the years. The letters get a little fuzzy. I was looking at it, can't quite make out. Maybe it's just bad, bad handwriting. The letters have, I got an eye loop later and got to looking at it, realized I couldn't read it because it was written in Italian. So, you know, there was an Italian immigrant out here that, that, uh, worked on the camp along with lots of others from other places. Visitors and laborers arrived to camp, you can see, via the inner urban. This photo was taken at 2nd Avenue and Grand, but you can see right there, inner urban station, trains to Camp Dodge. Millions of board feet of lumber were required to build that camp. And as it took shape, you can see all these structures going up in the background, but look at all the raw materials, the gravel for concrete to build footings, all of the dimension lumber, poles, beams, all stacked up there. This also documents the rail sidings that were built so they could offload these things. And again, back here on the hill is Northwest Beaver Drive. So we're looking to the Northeast in this pers perspective. Another shot is showing, you can see that car there stacked almost to the top with dimension lumber, lumber wagon there, other materials piled up. There's a locomotive there. They had, I think one steam locomotive that they rented from some, some uh, railroad outfit that uh, they used to, to shunt cars around and transport supplies. Again, not to belabor the point, but this is looking to the southeast. But again, you can see all the materials that it needed. It was essentially a city to itself out there. That house still survives. The museum is actually up here on the slope of the hill present day. And there's one more showing the, the sewer mains and water pipes. And this was when they were building that camp, just you know, daily. Uh, trains would arrive with raw materials, milled lumber, fittings, hardware. There's a, the leased locomotive. And there were some, camp, uh, some farms nearby that they built around. Oops, it looks like this is working now, good. But they see some farm buildings in the background. But the camp stretch, the built, environment stretched about three and a half miles from Northwest 70th present day up kind of a dog leg to the left. 
the land is nice and flat out there because that used to be the floodplain for the Des Moines River. Glaciation and other geological phenomena push the Des Moines River further to the east where we're used to it, its travel route, its, its flow today. But prior to that, uh, the floodplain from the old route of the Des Moines River made that a perfect place to construct those buildings. It's pretty flat level ground out there. They built over 150 barracks buildings, as you can see here. These small portions on the end of each one were kitchens. So they would have their meals down on the first floor. The soldiers would stay on the second. Each one of these buildings could house about 250 soldiers. And let's see. Yeah, I think we're looking to the east here. This is the uh, this is uh, Beaver Drive up on the hill. You'll notice down here, they were required, the contractor, Charles White's and Sons, the contractors were required to have photographs made to send into the War Department to document the, the construction at the camp, were they on schedule, what was being done. And you'll notice here, Charles White's and Sons, contractors, constructing quartermaster, Major Butler, September 5, 1917. That is the date that the first inductees arrived via the draft from Selective Service out at Camp Dodge. Years ago, 20, probably 20 years ago, I was at an event at the Hoyt Sherman place and I, after the event was over, I don't remember what it was, there's a gentleman standing there and his last name was Whites. I'm a taller, thin guy, gray hair. And I went up to him and I said, sir, I work out at Camp Dodge. And I said, the Whites company, are you related? And he said, he said, that was my grandfather's company. And he said he took great pride in the fact that they constructed that camp ahead of schedule and under budget, which is rare for anything connected to the government today. And he said there were a complete set of those project pictures that used to hang on a wall in their boardroom. They said as long as he was president, those pictures didn't get touched. They hung on the wall because that's what, no pun intended, really put whites on the map was the fact that they could take on a project of this scale and finish it ahead of had a schedule and under budget. World War I occurs during a period of time known as the Progressive Era, where uh, advocates of employing the federal government to cure the ills of society uh, wanted to bring that rationale into these camps. Earlier camps in the Civil War, Spanish-American War, they had a tendency to be ringed with establishments that uh, didn't live up to the progressive ideals, prostitution, liquor, gambling, things like that. So in order to give the, the soldiers something wholesome to do, they invited religious groups to build structures out there, and we'll see some here in an example, uh, to give them, there's the old saying, idle hands is the are the devil's playground. So if we can give the soldiers something positive and productive to do, let's do that and construct those facilities at the camp. This was known as the Liberty Theater. This structure back here, they played not only motion pictures, but this structure here was where, where they would bring the sets up and down. It's called a prosthenium, like in an opera house. You have the pre-printed set in the back and they would come up and come down. And a lot of the photos were taken from ph photographers that perched their panoramic cameras on top of here because it was elevated and they could swing that camera around 180 degrees or almost 360 to capture what the camp looked like. YMC Hostess House, uh, wives or mothers or fathers that want to come visit their sons, see how they were doing, was the army treating them okay? They could find lodging and, and be served meals here for a fee at the YMCA Hostess House. Red Cross had their own building. The soldiers could go there and they would receive free stationery and envelopes they could write home. They oftentimes had magazines for them to read, Knights of Columbus. There were other, uh, other organizations, the Jewish Welfare Board uh, constructed uh, a building out there at Camp Dodge. This photo shows the majority of the base hospital and that's the little town of Herald. So we're looking to the south here, I think. Actually, now we're looking to the north, but that's the town of Herald. And what happened to Harold in the early 1980s when the bottom dropped out of the farm real estate prices, Camp Dodge 
bought a lot in the state of Iowa for Camp Dodge, bought a bunch of property out to the north and the west, which is still Camp Dodge today. And they bought out the homeowners and, and Harold. There's one structure out there that remains. It was a kind of a two room schoolhouse, but they've done some restoration work to that. They use it as a training building, but that's the only structure that remains. When I started there about 24 years ago, there were th still three big four square houses that stood out there, but they've been taken down. If you drove up Beaver Drive with Camp Dodge to your left or to the west, you might remember the big concrete reservoir that sat out there. It would have been on the right-hand side, the million-gallon reservoir. And you can see it had a little scale here to tell you how many hundreds of thousands of gallons of water were in there uh, to guard, uh, guard against saboteurs or somebody that would want to poison the soldiers there. They built a fence around it, and they had a guard around it. There was a story, unproven because it was untrue, that they... Uh, a saboteur was shot off the top of the big mason jar full of poison. That never happened. But but those kinds of stories made the rounds, and they show up in letters, and people are coming to say, well, my grandpa wrote home in his letter that there was a set. Well, did he shoot him, or did he see him, or did he just hear the story? Because those kinds of things live on. This photo was taken from the Hyperion Golf and Motor Club, and the Hyperion Club is still there today. They've been uh, neighbors since the, the country club uh, predates World War I Camp Dodge by a couple of years as far as their, their purchase. But we're looking to kind of the Northwest. That house is the oldest structure at Camp Dodge. It's still there. It's a brick house. And that was on the, pro on the 74 acres that were bought on 9 April 19, sorry, April 1909, uh, I think it was April 12th, 1909, that would be the first land purchase that would grow into Camp Dodge and its uh, present day quarters. But that was constructed in, in 1874. That's the oldest structure at Camp Dodge. But you can see that the camp certainly is taking shape. Barracks buildings, as far as the eye can see. First inductees arrived, as I mentioned, 5 September 1917. The Selective Service, the military, remember the, remembering that there were ugly draft riots during the Civil War, changed the name. It's no longer called the draft. It's called the Selective Service. Why? Well, because it's an honor for you to be selected to serve in the military. In fact, the letters they got even said, your friends and countrymen have selected you to serve for service in the United States Army. And it's still called that today. When I was a senior decades ago, you went to the post office when you're 18, filled out your selective service card. So that name has stuck. So you see some new inductees arrive. They, the selective service set up local draft boards, just like they did your in, in past war. So it's not some nameless, faceless government. It's your fellow citizens that you appear for and you go to a local doctor and he says, yes, you're physically fit. They're the ones that are approving your entrance into the military. And so those 4, 000, there were 4,000 draft boards set up. Each draft district or town or township, whatever, they would get a number, a draft, a selective service number, one through however many people lived in that area. So when the Secretary of, the War, of War, they reach into a big fishbowl with a, up 4,000 numbers and stir it around, and this blindfolded Secretary of the War reached in there and pulled out the first number, which I think was like 263. Potentially, you could have 4,000 soldiers at a draw. It's a lottery system. So the first set of soldiers that show up, there are about 2,100 of them. That's because that was the first number that was pulled out of the fishbowl with corresponding draft board numbers. Oops, going the wrong way here. There we go. It was a different time, of course, because I don't think many people show up to join the army today in suit coats and ties. But again, the draft applies to everybody in society because standing right next to him is a guy that I think looks like Harrison Ford uh, wearing a suit coat, but he's wearing coveralls or bib overalls underneath. And here's a guy right next to him with a bow tie, brought what they thought they needed. So each one would leave you would register for the selective service. You would get a selective service number. 
get a uh, physical to say, yes, you're eligible to serve. And then if your number gets drawn, then you would get a postcard saying you are to report to Camp Dodge at a certain date. Everybody would show up at the, oftentimes for the, at the courthouse, or they would give them a little going away breakfast and the mayor would give a little speech. Then they would get on a train in their hometown and they would arrive to Camp Dodge on that date. So their date of induction is the date that they showed up at Camp, that they're, they got their postcard, said you're gonna be in the army at this date. They were sent to Camp Dodge. So each one was sent with a little note pinned to them that said wherever they were supposed to report and where they would go to the in the camp. First inductee from Iowa, George C. Whitmer. As I said, there's the first lottery draw. They pulled 2,350 men. He served as a Sergeant First Class Company A, 313th Supply Train, 88th Division. He served his entire time with the 88th Division. And in the 1960s, he was a mayor of Des Moines. So he lived his whole, yeah, if that name sounds familiar. There's also a Whitmer Park. I, yeah. My daughter and I used to go fish there off 34th Street. Yep. Four months of basic training, stress, physical fitness. General Pershing, who was appointed General of the Armies, John Joseph Pershing. He was troubled by the fact that the Europeans had allowed themselves to become mired down in a system of trench warfare. Now, the Americans arriving weren't going to make a difference because building dugouts and trenches protected soldiers from the, the effects of poison gas and high, machine guns and magazine rifles and high explosive rounds. So the, the weapons favored the defense. But Pershing wanted an army that was physically fit, that stretched, stretched, stressed the offensive. And when, like in the early days of the First World War, eventually we're gonna break through those trenches and then it's gonna be a war of maneuver. And he wanted US soldiers to be ready for that and to be, ready, be in good shape to prosecute that kind of a conflict. So, starts with morning exercise. Marksmanship, what they're doing is they're looking down essentially planks that have rifle sights mounted to them properly aligned with a target or a bullseye in the distance so that when they went to the firing range and lined up the sights on the rifle, they would know what a correct sight picture would look like. So that's what they're all doing there. They're all getting down there and taking a peek and okay, that's what, this, that's what the sight picture should look like. Your uh, other not not loaded rifles, obviously, but when the United States goes to war, it does not have any steel helmets. We do not have any gas masks, and we don't have enough rifles. So we begin to build the issue rifle, which was an M1903 30 caliber Springfield. We also converted the chamber, the caliber of weapons that we were making for the British, and we called them M1917 Enfields because the Ordnance Department said. We can get rifles and soldiers' hands faster by simply converting weapons we're already making for the Allies rather than start from scratch and, and start building just one type. But they also built out, also issued weapons that were already in stock, that were obsolete. That's a Craig Jorgensen 30 40 caliber rifle used in the Spanish American War. It's a bolt action, five shot. But they used those. Those were good enough to learn how to use and how to fire and how to learn how to shoulder a weapon. And so we had about 20,000 weapons that were sent out to Camp Dodge that were M1917 Enfields and about 10,000 rifles that were surplus from the Spanish-American War and the Philippine War. Learning simple things, how to deliver a proper salute, military courtesy, squad company and battalion drill. You see big Units marching, a couple hundred of them. Oh, they learn by four at a time, eight at a time, 12 at a time. Then pretty soon they put them together into bigger groups, learn how to respond to a commanding officer's orders or a non-commissioned officer's orders. So you can see them all here, learning left face, right face, column left, column right, whatever it is they have them do. And then they put them together. They learn those basic skills. They put them together and it's like a basketball team. You learn how to dribble, you learn how to shoot, and you put them together on the team and deploy those skills. Military tactics, a lot of instruction when the weather was nice took place outdoors. They paraded at night uh, for a retreat. They would play retreat, lower the flag at the post. 
bayonet training. One soldier wrote home that they taught you how to put a lot of hate into it. Trench training complex, that was on the western edge of Camp Dodge. When the war was over, nobody went out and filled the trenches in, just volunteer trees and grass grew up around them, and the trees moved toward the, uh, moved toward the rail line. You can see the buildings of Camp Dodge in the background and volunteer trees and brush grew up around there and nobody really knew where those trenches were. It was beyond memory. People that did know, why would you have a reason to go out there? So in the 19, we are gonna go back here. About 10 years ago, a guy named Jamie Conley who works in the map shop at Camp Dodge had been given access to DNR photos employing a technology called LIDAR. I can't remember what all the letters stand for, but it's light intensive something. But essentially they can send a signal down and bounce it off the ground and it erases all of the trees and brush so that you get an accurate picture of the contours and the topographical features of a certain area. He noticed some odd looking lines out there. They didn't look like it was natural erosion or streams from the floods of 93 or something like that. So he went out there and looked around and he was finding things at right angles and odd angles. And so he, he approached me and then Mary Jones, who's now retired but worked in the environmental office. And she said, that's probably the trench complex because we know it existed from postcards and photos from the First World War. So they ended up getting some funding. They brought archeologists out there and sure enough, that's what it was. They found dummy training grenades and spent shells and some other things that dated to the First World War. So those went, forgot, those were forgotten, essentially, at least the location, until we kind of connected the dots. They had a gas training shed at Camp Dodge. I selected this image because they were part of the 42nd Division. Those might be Iowa National Guardsmen because they were absorbed into the 42nd. But you can see a soldier there with a gas mask bag over his nose. Gas uh, was unveiled by the Germans at the Battle of Ypres, I think in Belgium, in uh, April of 1915. And uh, we issued British what were called small box respirators to our troops, and we modeled the American version after what the British used, and we're also starting to arm our soldiers with uh, steel helmets, M1917 steel helmets. Well, we bought about 300,000 from the British. And so when donations come into the collection, sometimes they're British made, sometimes they're American made. When not training, soldiers spend time in the barracks. They slept on uh, steel frame beds. And these mattresses are of note. Does anybody hear the radio commercials or see the commercials on TV for sleep comfort beds? You dial in your number if you want to affirm. The Army was way ahead of that. They were way out ahead of that. They uh, took the soldiers, they would get their mat, their bed frames, they would give them one of these mattress ticks, and then they'd take them to a straw pile. So if you wanted a firm mattress, you put more straw in. You want a thin mattress, you put left in. So you could customize your own mattress. Again, they were way ahead of the sleep comfort people. In addition to military training and physical fitness, they also organized a variety of baseball, football teams. And uh, the guy that was put in charge of this would go on. He was a coach at Drake Stadium. And they gave him a, a, an officer's rank. Captain John Griffith was the division athletic director. So he organized almost like intramural sports or club sports. And so this photo was, uh, this, this was from a, an activity that took place July 4th, 1918. Community Service Championship of the 88th Division, United States Army. Grand Military Athletic Meet. There's a shot of a couple of the baseball teams playing each other at Camp Dodge. You can see the uh, smokestacks of the power plant at Camp Dodge and some of the barracks buildings. That might be near the hospital, actually. Another shot, laundry bag tied to the end there. You've got leggings on. If you have photos of soldiers, family members that were veterans in the First World War, if they are wearing a hat like this, 
it was taken before they went to Europe. Because once they went to Europe, what are you going to do with a hat like that when you move to the front? You put your helmet on, you can't put it in your pocket, you can't roll it up, it's kind of a stiff felt. So they ended up issuing these flat helmets, or sorry, these flat hats like you've seen. I think still, the military still wears today. They call them overseas caps. Today they call them garrison caps. The Air Force calls them flight caps. Also, if they're wearing leggings like that, canvas leggings that lace up on the outside, that fo their photo was probably taken before they went overseas. Because once they went overseas, they used to wrap cloth called putties like the British did around their ankles. So they're just some datable clues for any photos that might be in your family collections. I mentioned each barracks had a mess hall. You can see the cups and saucers adorning each table. Some soldiers dining. You can also see what looked to be a kind of enameled tinware, kind of the miscolored ones. And about 20 years ago, went out uh, to where the incinerator site used to be in present day Camp Dodge. And the garbage that didn't burn, the broken dishes, <coughs> bent dishes, they all got pitched down the hill by the incinerator on the bank of Beaver Creek. So when the, the water rises and falls, it sometimes exposes those artifacts that were tossed out there. And a warrant officer and I, Wes Bender, we went out there and you can see the, the same kind of dishes that are captured in those images sitting on the table. And that enamel tin piece, that has U.S. stamped on it. I think that has a U.S. stamp. That one there says QMC for Quartermaster Corps, Buffalo, China. It was made by the same company that made dishes for the Pullman sleeping cars for the railroad. Is that again in the front? Good question. As that was my next, next point to make. That is uh, uh, architectural fragment from the Million Gallon Reservoir. In 2009, after almost 100 years of service, they, uh, actually no, it was 2007, after about 90 years of service, they decided that they were gonna tear that down, put up a modern water tower. The contractors came out and they said, looked at it, yeah, we should have this down in about half a day. They whacked away with a big ball on a chain for a day and a half trying to knock that thing down. There was re-rod that was an inch thick inch in diameter, and it was interlaced in the concrete. Then they had a riveted steel support in the inside, almost like a spider web to keep that thing from falling in. And, and imagine the pressure exerted on the walls of a million gallon tank. But yeah, after two and a half days of whacking away, they finally knocked it down. But one of our uh, former volunteers, he had been a contractor and he had a, he had a torch because they had it all roped off. They didn't want anybody getting in there and getting hurt. And he said, I'll just wait till, this, till it's dark. He goes, I'll go out there with my torch and get you a couple of souvenirs. So he cut that out of the, cut that out of the metal and brought that back to us. I mentioned that the Army was segregated. In the fall of 1917, they brought black soldiers out to Camp Dodge uh, to, be, to train as part of the 366th Infantry Regiment. Uh, some newspaper stories were written about how were the black soldiers from Alabama going to become accustomed to the winter in Iowa. They would train here at Camp Dodge until July 1918, and then they would be transferred from Camp Dodge, and they were assigned to the 92nd Infantry Division, which did see combat on the Western Front during the First World War. Remember that Fort Des Moines, and I know you've had some programs on Fort Des Moines, they were the, the site of the Army's first black officer candidate school. The draft applies to everybody. So they knew that the black units that already existed on the Army's roster are going to swell and that they're going to need officers. So other than someone going to West Point, the Army provided the opportunity for blacks to become officers for the very first time. I think 633 graduated as captains, first lieutenant, second lieutenants at Fort Des Moines. And some of them, as you can see pictured here, I don't know if any of this is just kind of a generic image, but some of them were, were uh, eventually when they graduated from Fort Des Moines, they sent them out to Camp Dodge to teach classes for non-commissioned officer schools and also to be instructors for the black draftees, the ones that came from Alabama and some from Iowa at Camp Dodge. Camp Dodge was also known for having the first newspaper to go up, go to print in any of the cantonment camps. 
they called their publication the Cam Dodger. There was a guy named Lawrence Farrell, and that's his uniform. This has since gone off exhibit. But uh, he, he set up and organized a newspaper. When the 88th Division deploys to France, they continue to, to print the Camp Dodger at Camp Dodge. But when the unit gets to France, they, Farrell rounds up some of his, uh, his accomplices from Camp Dodge, and he gets them together printing a Camp Dodger in Europe. So this was the overseas edition. Once they get to France and begin training, they, they printed their own newspaper there too. So if you want to know kind of what will happen, and, and again, getting back to the, uh, getting back to the, you can see sports scores, what's going on in Europe, different stories of note. A, a guy wrote a, an article a while back, I can't remember if it was published in the Annals of Iowa, but he wrote his paper on the Camp Dodge newspaper and how that gave the soldiers, remember I talked about Camp Dodge being a home of way, away from home, a sense of that being their hometown newspaper. They could find out what was going on in other units, how was their favorite Camp Dodge baseball or football team doing, and it gives them a, uh, it developed a, a sense of, of, of a, what do I say, home, that's not even a word, hometownism, but a, a sense of place and a sense of belonging. Again, when you got on average, 25 to 35,000 troops in one area, it allows them to sort of belong to the whole. Would volunteers and or draftees from Iowa most likely have trained at Camp Dodge, or was the draft, how did the selected service do that? Did they send them maybe somewhere else to train? Yes. On what was the, the unit that was filling out? Or? Initially, like I said, they would try to send them to a cantonment camp that was geographically closest to where they had been drafted. But later on, as units got trained and deployed, that left vacancies at different camps. So, so somebody that was drafted maybe in, in September of 1918, the war ends later in November, they might end up getting sent to another camp in Arkansas or, or maybe some other place in Illinois. That's a good question. 5 July 1918, many of the soldiers the day before, they had the day off for the 4th of July, they watched the uh, 313th engineers construct the scaffolding. Uh, three African-American soldiers um, were convicted of assaulting a white woman, a fiance of a soldier that was at Camp Dodge, he was out there to visit him. We have the transcripts from that trial. They ended up testifying against each other that they were all there. Um, but they were executed, I think, about 9 or 9.30 a.m., 5 July 1918. That was the only triple execution in Iowa's history, and it was the only military execution in Iowa's history. The Spanish influenza, it's not that long ago for us to remember COVID, everybody wearing masks. The same thing happened in 1917. The Spanish influenza is a misnomer. Scientists, biologists have determined that it probably was a combination of an avian flu or a, uh, a hogborn pathogen that mutated with an avian flu or an avian flu that, hog, that uh, mutated with a, or was a mutation from a uh, birds have all kinds of flu all the time, but typically it's not passable to humans. But if you have some intermediary hosts that, like you might remember the, uh, I'm trying to remember, was it the hog influenza in the 60s? But, uh, swine, swine flu, thank you. Yeah, swine flu. So I couldn't remember the term. But that was another example. So there's been these examples over time. Because the allies and the central powers were losing, into, well, let me back up here. The mutation probably occurred in Kansas because that's when people start to have symptoms and start to die in larger percentages than just flu season. Um, it ends up going being taken by U.S. soldiers that were deployed to France. It mutates there into a more lethal strain, is reintroduced back in the United States, and then as soldiers are delivered home or they travel on trains just like the flu today, it spreads all over. <coughs> eventually arrives in 1917. Some of the first uh, deaths occur in September. The highest death rate at Camp Dodge was between 6 and 16, October 1918. On average, 50 soldiers a day were dying out of Camp Dodge. 
702 soldiers are, have been identified as, as perishing from the flu, probably more before they knew what it was. And some of them, just like COVID, some of it probably into the early 1919, people may have been dying from it, but uh, not properly identified. Over 10,000 men, women, and nurses, doctors were bedridden at Camp Dodge. They converted some of the barracks. Uh, remember, I showed you the hospital with 2,100 beds. They filled the hospital beds. They moved into adjacent barracks and turned those into hospital wards. A total by the end of the war, not just Camp Dodge, but for the United States, 35,000 35, soldiers die of the flu. Almost as many as died as a result of action with the enemy in the First World War. July 25, 1918, the 88th Division that prior to that had existed as a training division, they would train soldiers up to uh, proficiency as a trench mortarman or a baker or a shoe repairman or artilleryman, infantryman, artilleryman, whatever it was. And then they would transfer them to another unit, that a division that had already was slated to go to France or had already arrived in France. They get orders in July 1918 that they are to begin, they were to recruit to full size and they are to eventually deploy to France. It's in July 1918 that Camp Dodge has its highest number of soldiers, the 18,000 required to run the camp, and then 27,000 on top of that when they recruited the division to full strength of 27,000. So that resulted in over 46,000 soldiers at one time out of Camp Dodge. The most famous photo was taken after the 88th Division departed, 22 August 1918, 18,000 officers and men posing the shape of the Statue of Liberty. You can see the first row standing there, back and forth. 12,000 just in the arm and the torch. Mole and Thomas out of Chicago, they went around the country, would uh, arrange soldiers in different formations. At Camp Dodge, we use that example. They built a 40-foot tower, positioned the camera there. The days before, they drove stakes in the ground with cloth tape. One of those two, Moeller Thomas, came from a family that had a lace making company. I don't know anything about making lace, but apparently some byproduct is, is the cloth piece of tape that you detach the lace from. So they had tons of this cloth tape and they used the cloth tape to string out with uh, wooden stakes. So when everybody fell into formation, they knew they were supposed to stand as detail lines or perimeter lines. And what's interesting about that is the perspective is pretty accurate. If you see pictures of the Statue of Liberty, she's not too tall and skinny. She's not too short, you know, it's not short and wide. Looks about the way it's supposed to. That company went on the road. They went to army bases. They went to Navy bases, had them stand in the shape of a, an anchor, Marine Corps base and a globe and anchor. I've seen other, and other companies saw what they were doing and they went out and did the same thing. If you type out human statues, do a Google search, you'll see them all over the country in all kinds of different shapes. But this is probably the most famous image that was ever taken at Camp Dodge. 20 years ago, I went to the Ellis Island Museum and they, were, they, had, a, they had an example of it out there, like ashtrays and everything that had a, a depiction of the Statue of Liberty. And I was surprised to see that out there. That was before I worked at Camp Dodge, but I connected with it because it was from Iowa. July 2007, for whatever reason, someone decides to publish that in Martha Stewart Magazine. And pretty soon the phone starts ringing off the hook out of Camp Dodge. I saw this picture and is it the real thing? Is it the real deal? Is it Photoshop? So then we went to the Camp Dodger newspaper on microfilm and were able to tease out the details. And I think 18 men died of, uh, or not died, but fainted from heat stroke that day. It was about 90 degrees in August. You know, we know what August in Iowa was like. And it took them a little less than two hours to get everybody into formation, snap the photo, and then they sold them to the soldiers for $2. The actual images, I think, are maybe 14 by 20, kind of a sepia tone. In the, uh, following the departure of the 88th Division, as I mentioned earlier, they, the Army begins to set up the 19th Division at Camp Dodge. Now they've got some real estate. Now these soldiers, they would have been volunteers that were assigned to the regular Army. Some may have been draftees, I guess. Um, one of the soldiers that was there. Let me see if I can find his name here. There we go. Bradley O.N. Major Infantry. Let's see. 
the 2nd Battalion, 14th Infantry. He was page, his name was on page 177 of the Camp Dodge Officer's Directory. He would, that's Omar Bradley that was Patton's boss in World War II. He was a West Point graduate, and he was wringing his hands when the war ended. Why? He didn't get to the shooting war. If you're a West Point graduate and you're going to have a career in the Army and you miss the war, eh, that doesn't, the guys that have that on their resume, they're probably, well, what he didn't know is he would retire years later as the last five-star general. He stayed in and, like I said, would retire as the Army's last five-star general. In the early 70s, a public affairs officer at Camp Dodge had the good sense to write a letter to him because he still had an office somewhere. I don't know if it was at the Pentagon when you're a five-star general, you know, if you want to continue to have an office. But he, he worked and, and rode and into old age. So Lieutenant Colonel, I can't remember his name, Anderson, I think was his name, wrote him a letter and said, you know, sir, I, my understanding is that you were a soldier at Camp Dodge in the First World War. If you have time, would you mind sharing some reminiscences of, of your experiences there? We have in the collection a single space, two and a half page letter uh, with his signature on it under the five star flag, general's flag. And he said he lost friends to the influenza. He enjoyed his time at Camp Dodge. He mentions that he's worried that he's, his career thought it was going to be got going nowhere because he hadn't deployed before the war ended. But sometimes people at the right place at the right time have a good thought and write those letters and ask for information. So that's kind of a little footnote to Camp Dodge, but an interesting one nonetheless. He wasn't from Iowa? No, was not in Iowa. That's a good question. I don't know where he was from, but he wasn't a native Iowan. This is a give you the bigger footprint of Camp Dodge. All told, by the end of the war, 8.1 square miles. And you can see the railroad running through there. There's a little town of Harold, the Triangle. Then this would run up to Perry. They had an artillery range, but they fired non-exploding ordnance. They were wooden training rounds. And then this area down here in the river bottom is where the... Uh, where the rifle range was, but it was, a, it was a big place. By comparison, Fort Des Moines was one square mile where they trained cavalry uh, and had the black OCS during the war, but that kind of gives you the footprint. What else is interesting is how far the distance is. I'm trying to remember, there's Polk City. Des Moines isn't even on the map yet. There's from, from Camp Dodge, down to where Des Moines is, there was 10 miles of farmland to give you an idea of how, you know, urban sprawl, how these communities have grown. Here's Grimes. Um, when you, and this is just a, a, a snapshot, but uh, like you go down here, Urbandale sits by itself, West Des Moines sits by itself. There's two, three miles between all of these things that today we just think is a continue, contiguous metro area. 11 November, 1918. It uh, used to be called Armistice Day. So I think after the Korean War, they changed the name to Veterans Day. Uh, the war is over, and the government doesn't need Camp Dodge. They don't need to train soldiers anymore. Camp Dodge continues to be an induction station until about 12 December 1918. Then it is redesignated as a demobilization point where soldiers would come to get their discharge. They get whatever it costs for train fare to get them back home. The last of their pay. And in summary, they inducted 111,462 men into the Army. Iowa ranks 13th for the number of soldiers, whether they came to Camp Dodge or not, the total number of soldiers that served in the First World War. From the 48 states at that time, uh, Camp Dodge ranked 13th out of 48. Reached a peak garrison, as I mentioned, in July of 1918, a little past 46,000. And at the end of the war, they would demobilize over 200,000 soldiers out of Camp Dodge, not only Iowans, but others that would go on to different places with a discharge in their hand and the best wishes of Uncle Sam. We have in the collection a discharge document that was brought in by the granddaughter of the veteran. And she showed it to me and I looked at it and what struck me was the writing was beautiful handwriting just like, like wedding invitation calligraphic handwriting. And I said, boy, that's beautiful. And she said, that's exactly what the Army thought. 
they invited a bunch of guys into a room and they said, we want you to write this. They wrote a sentence on the blackboard. We want you to write this on a piece of paper. And they saw how beautiful his handwriting was. And he got invited to stay for another six months to write out discharges for other soldiers. And she's told me, she said, this one, that was the last discharge he made out. And he always said that was his favorite. Sure. Why is the grandfather was Mm -hmm. And the story he told about getting this charge was that I think he meant, I don't know, he came back from the ship mm -hmm. in New York or somewhere. And they put everybody in the train, said, so, okay, all you guys from Iowa are going to start, all you guys from wherever we're going. And then so they, they just went across from New York or where it was, across the thing, okay, okay, all you guys are going to be and he lived, I don't know, but I was sitting here somewhere. I, I don't know where. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, I'm going to get off. And he was 40 miles from my grandmother's hometown. And so he called us to say he was home, say he was going to do the class. And then he put on his back and he started off. He was 40 miles, he hiked 40 miles to get into the class. Hmm. Now, I'm wonder, so the next thing that Camp Dodge was a discharge point, I wonder, I'm wondering how well, I, 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 I don't, I, the short story, I can't, I don't know why that happened. Uh, yeah, I don't know, I was wondering how that, how long discharge did everything. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, New York was in any court. And, and it may have been it may have been a situation where he got permission or approval to hike home rather than to come come to Camp Dodge for another two or three or four days to get out processed and then take a train back to his hometown. That's the only yeah, reason I, I could think that would happen. I, I, I don't know what it, what it, it, it sounded in the library that you already know that this is a whole bunch of guys to put on a train to take your home. Mm -hmm. And he he may he Camp Dodge may not have been the demobilization point for him. He may have been discharged at Hoboken, New Jersey, or Chicago, Illinois, or someplace else along the route. That, your guess is probably as good as mine. And we'll probably never know know anymore. It should be, yeah. Down at the bottom, yeah. Usually it would say where they were in, in the, the date. Yep. Yeah. There's a story of one guy, he didn't live too far from Camp Dodge, and, he, and as the train crossed an intersection where he knew exactly where he was, he threw his rifle out the window because he wanted that as a souvenir, and then he just waited till he got out process. And oops, I left it behind, so I lost it, whatever. But he went back to the ditch and he brought his rifle home. World War I Camp Dodge still has some souvenirs as part of its built environment. This is an engineer depot powder house, and the rail line used to run right by here by the loading dock, so gunpowder would be stored in there. And it's uh, they put a fence up around it. That is the, there's only two of those left in the United States. One is at Camp Shelby, Mississippi, but theirs got moved to make way for another project and it's in a new location. The one out at Camp Dodge in the training area is the only one in the world still in its original location. There's a little sign on the backside stating what it is and why it's important. The 1918 Arsenal building, a lot of the photographs were taken from on top here too, because it was a nice high place where they could rotate that camera 360. Uh, that was built in 1918, that still exists. There's an earlier building across the street this way, built in 1915. Uh, if you have a chance, like, uh, like you heard, if you want to come out to the museum sometime, no admission, we're there Tuesdays through Fridays, nine to three and Saturdays, 10 to two. But we have, uh, we tell a little bit more of the Camp Dodd story, motion picture footage of training activities. That truck was brought to Camp Dodge in 1918. It's a Type B Liberty. It's the only, it's an example of the Army's first standardized truck. The other vehicles they had, they bought uh, off the market, cars, trucks, motorcycles, and painted them green. 
but that is one of only 15 on exhibit in the United States. And it's a little rarer version because it has the wooden spokes and it has the earlier, has the earlier lights. So of those 15, we have one that's a little rare. Any questions? Yes. Um, th those eventually probably once they once they left Camp Dodge, I don't have any way to uh, unless they're an individual from Iowa on their service card, we can figure out where they went and then kind of guess about when they arrived in France. Yeah. Oh, the 2,100 and some that uh, were the first inductees? No, none of the inductees. I'm saying all these people were being trained. They were already in existence. You said 213 people were being trained. Yeah. And then they were being trained. So my question is, and then, so we declared them, yeah, we declared we're on whatever thing, but whatever thing, they were being trained. But they were being trained. But then the system about 17 and then the building. September 17th or something, the day when the camp opened. Yeah. So between April and that, when you got training guys, is anybody fighting over Correct. there from ours? And then how did that happen? When did, when did they go over? Or when they completed three? four months of basic training. They would go to France, and usually they would be trained by French instructors. Some French instructors actually came to Camp Dodge to teach during the war as well. But the first U.S. Infantry Division was the first U.S. Army Division to arrive. Prior to that, they sent staff officers over there to set up, okay, where are we going to build our camps? Where are we going to get our food to set up the logistical support for a bunch of men going over? So by July of 1918, Merle Hay, Private Merle D. Hay, he's marching in a parade in Paris on, his, on July 30th on his, I think, 20, 21st birthday. The first combat between Americans and Germans occurs to, on the night, earlier morning hours of 3 November 1917, and there are three soldiers killed, Merle D. Hay, Bethel Gresham, and Thomas Enright. One was, I think, from Ohio, one maybe from Pennsylvania. Those are the first three American combat casualties in the First World War, and Merle Hay probably was the first of those three to die. Uh, it was a German trench raid to collect American prisoners. So yes, we do have troops on the ground before we start to send them from the from the cantonment camps. And there were some discussions between General Pershing, and he was supported by the staffers at the War Department and the President. They wanted to just absorb American troops as replacements for the French Army. And Pershing said, no, we are going to come over here, we are going to train and fight and prosecute this war as an independent American Army. And it's not until really the spring of 1918 the Germans launch an offensive because they could see that number of American troops keeps growing. Before we, they could make a difference in the fight, they wanted to see if they could force the, the French and the French and British into surrendering. That, uh, that offensive was stalled, Second Battle of the Marne. And then after that, then it, we start pushing the Germans back by August of 1918. The Germans are, are withdrawing rapidly and Pershing's tactics of a, a mobile force come into play then. Well, someone who was not an expert, maybe a better about this, said someone who was a professor about the history of Vienna, was essentially a stalemate in Europe, and that whatever the weather system had built up the previous centuries, now it was a stalemate for all this stuff, and then there was only one knee came over, the Americans came over, and then progress was made, whatever tactics they were using. It would be incorrect to say that we won the war, but we certainly helped the Allies win the war. And the Germans were running out of men and raw materials, and things things started really going badly late July, about the time the 88th Division, not that that made a difference. They would not see any, they would not arrive uh, in France. They would not arrive at the front until about September 1918, and the war ends in November. They lost a handful of, of, of pr individuals as prisoners, and they had a few casualties, but they see very little uh, service on the Western Front. Okay, you're welcome. Good question. Actually, I'm going to put a pause right in. Uh, you are all welcome to stay and ask questions. I just want to go ahead and wrap up the live stream. So I want to thank the West Des Moines Library, the Friends Foundation of the West Des Moines Library, 
for allowing us to be here today. There are some really fascinating pieces of trench art, which is from World War I, or that's how it really got its start, at the Jordan House in our West Des Moines at War exhibit. So that was actually a French magazine that saw all of the shells around, all artillery shells, and said, let's run a contest to see who can come up with the most creative design. So that's how what we now know as trench art got started. So come see us at the Jordan House Museum. Again, West Des Moines at War will be up through December of this year. So you can come visit us on Fridays and Sundays, 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. Uh, next Iowa Files will be on Sunday, November 19th, and that will be a reenactor performing uh, a soliloquy as uh, U.S. Grant, Ulysses S. Grant. So it's touching and humorous and really an amazing opportunity to ask a lot of questions of the man himself. And Omar Bradley was born in Missouri. Okay. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> so, so is Pershing coincidentally. Oh, okay. Something in the water. I think and, so. and all most of the astronauts came from Ohio. Hmm. So, so anyway, um, we're going to stop the live stream. But you guys who are here, more than welcome to keep asking questions. So thank you so much. Good.